and the stop is at 18 minutes in hopes that there are at least two minutes of questions. If you stop sooner, that's better yet, so we can have a bit more conversation with people. My title is Fitness Cliffs and Vicious Circles, and it really comes from my background hanging around people with the at the University of Michigan and really reading some interesting things even before I got there. The theme is, here's evolutionary medicine, here's complexity theory. We're blessed here at ASU with having a bunch of world's experts on complexity, and Manfred Laubichler is in the back and we'll speak in a bit, who's led the charge for a deep in intersection between ASU and the Santa Fe Institute. So I do think this is a special opportunity. On the other hand, the whole purpose of the workshop is to see if that's true or not. Uh, we're going to talk with each other and see, and it's an experiment. These are books that influenced me hugely when I was younger. Uh, Cybernetics, which I read several times. If you haven't read it, it's a very interesting read, and the whole last chapter is about mental disorders. I wish I could get every psychiatrist to read it. Von Bertalanthe's General Systems Theory. I wondered why I couldn't understand it all when I read it. I decided later it wasn't my fault. But nonetheless, it's a good place to get started in thinking about these things. John Holland was a huge inspiration to me and a deep friend at University of Michigan, and talking with him about complex systems really got me uh, thinking much more about it. Uh, also, Bob Axelrod was there, another friend, Carl Simon, Bobby Lowe. It was just a marvelous atmosphere for trying to connect these ideas. So the big, simple idea in one half of evolutionary medicine is that we need to shift our perspective. Most medical research is exclusively about mechanisms and what's broken. Um, evolutionary medicine asks from an engineer's point of view, not what's broken, but why was it vulnerable in the first place. I'm going to emphasize that this is only one part of evolutionary medicine. There are a lot of people doing phylogenetic studies and other kinds of studies that are wonderful and relevant. This is what I've been interested in. It's turning out, though, that I think this is too narrow uh, a mandate for us. We study six reasons that have proved quite robust in terms of finding reasons why traits are vulnerable to failure and looking at these different traits. But notice the kind of traits we've been looking at. A lot of them are big things you can see, birth canal, you know, fever. Some of them are responses. A lot of them are genes. And we've been looking at each of these things saying, why has natural selection left the body with traits like these that make us vulnerable to disease? But you notice this big open space here. This is standard evolutionary medicine. But I think it's time to consider another shift in perspective, which is to bring in thinking not just about traits, but traits about processes. Not just why the trait is vulnerable, but why a control system is vulnerable to failure. And I think this is probably a wide open field. I mean, a lot of people who are doing work around the edges, some very sophisticated fancy modeling, especially on genetics and complex systems, but it hasn't been brought to bear so much on medicine. And I think that's an opportunity for us. Life in one phrase is stabilized control systems, chemical control systems. That's its essence. Everybody learns about homeostasis, but of course that's the least of it. Actually, we're talking about rheostasis and allostasis, plasticity, facultative adaptations, things that all blend into one another. So if that's life, what's disease? Well, first of all, this is my model of a control system. It's not that easy to find a great diagram of a control system, actually, and all of its different components. Um, but you have to emphasize that there's the environment out there. It can be internal or external, the system here. And it needs a sensor and a comparator and a factor. And I'm not going to go through these now, but it's very helpful to have a diagram of all the different components of a control system. So if life is you know, working control systems, disease almost always results from some kind of defect in control systems. <coughs> Two questions I think are very important and we'll focus on during our conversations in the next day or so. First, what are their failure modes? How many different ways can they fail? Is it sensible to make a list of those? Second of all, why are they vulnerable to failure? Not just looking at the birth canal itself, but the whole system. So what we're up to here is trying to put this control system thinking in between the six reasons for why natural selection leaves traits vulnerable and the traits themselves. There are five questions I'd like us to be thinking about. The first is, what are these failure modes? The second, why so many false alarms in responsive systems, especially defensive systems? Three, why do we so often see positive feedback responsible for the disease? Why can't natural selection prevent that? Four, are there special risks from adjustable thresholds to response systems? And five, what about cliff edge effects and the possibility that they can explain some of what has become a mystery of 
missing heritability. So what are the failure modes? This is a topic for conversation over the next day to get us started. A lot of them are normal false alarms. There's actually nothing wrong with the system. Positive feedback is another failure mode. Sometimes systems cycle, especially between extremes, if the damping isn't working right. Sometimes the shift point is set, it is different. Different kinds of failure modes. And fortunately, we have an engineer here who's a world expert on failure modes who's going to give a talk in about 40 minutes about this exact topic. Why so many false alarms is the second question. This is really what got me into thinking more deeply about all of this. When I saw patients in the clinic, you know, and it's most problems people bring to their doctors are excessive defenses, fever, pain, nausea, vomiting, anxiety. Usually they're not necessary in that instance. And I wrapped my mind about that for a year before I finally recognized this was a signal detection problem. You should express the defense whenever the cost of the defense is less than the cost of harm. And the cost of the defense is often much less than the cost of no defense if there's a danger present. So an optimal system generates many false alarms. This insight changed how I practice psychiatry, and it has a potential, I think, to be useful for every clinician every day, as it gives them a tool for thinking more deeply about when they should use different drugs for different things. We call this the smoke detector principle. We all put up with false alarms in our smoke detectors because we want to make sure to have an alarm every time there's a real fire because we don't want to be there. Question three, what about failures from positive feedback? Once I started thinking about this, I don't know why I didn't think about it before. It's everywhere. I mean, there are all kinds of symptoms that cause, in particular in my business, fear, which cause more symptoms, which cause more fear. But it's not just anxiety disorders, it's everywhere. Dermatology, what's their most common problem? It's the scratch itch cycle. Uh, you scratch, you itch, it damages your skin, it causes more inflammation, causes more itch. It's very hard to break this cycle. Heart failure is one of the best examples of all. Um, if, in fact, your heart is failing and it expands too much, Starling's Law says that beyond a certain point, instead of contracting more, it contracts less. And this means that it, it gets worse. What's worse beyond that is that your kidneys, at that point, begin holding in more water, which makes the whole system work yet worse. And this is why, once you go into cardiac failure, it often gets worse and worse and worse. What a dumb design. You've got to ask yourself why. The evolutionary answer is pretty clear. The system was never designed for heart failure. It was designed for people who were dehydrated. Vicious circles. Why are we vulnerable? There's lots of them. Talked about scratch itch and congestive heart failure. Scratch itch is a defense. Congestive heart failure, it becomes a problem because of mismatch with modern environments. Obesity. Did you ever think about it? Once you get obese to a certain point, everything starts hurting. And then once you get more obese because of that, you can't exercise at all, and by that point you're in a wheelchair or, or being wheeled around. Cytokine storm. You get a certain amount of cytokines damaging your tissues, and they release more cytokines and create a cytokine storm and kill you. This is very serious stuff, this positive feedback um, model. Cancer. And the essence of cancer is you get enough cells going, and they create microenvironments for themselves where more cells can grow faster another positive feedback process. And of course, panic attacks, which is what I've treated most of my life. Most panic attacks are ordinary you know, fight flight responses that turn out to cause a person fear that they're going to have another one. And then the least cue makes them think, oh my god, another one's coming, at which point they start breathing more deeply, their heart starts beating, they start sweating, and they get convinced, oh, it's coming again, causing more fear, and they're off into a panic attack. And then there's addiction. What more simple example could better be than that? The more you take, the more you take, because it changes the regulation system. Fourth question is, what, are there special perils of self-adapting systems? And this is an idea I want to talk with people about, but it seems to me that natural selection has shaped certain systems that adjust thresholds and gain as a function of experience. And if the system is not doing an adequate job of protecting you, whether it's the anxiety system or pain or nausea and vomiting, then these systems, it seems to me, adjust to become more sensitive because they're not doing their job. And any such system would be inherently vulnerable to running off into a positive feedback cycle. So if you keep encountering lions, you better have more panic and stay home. The pain system, I think this might be a key to chronic pain, actually, because if pain keeps going off, it means whatever you're doing is not sufficient to keep you from damaging tissues. And there may well be a system here that adjusts the pain threshold as a function of experience. 
in ways in some people that might make you more vulnerable in the future. Starvation, and we see the eating disorders, I think, are another positive feedback that gets going because of this. You try to starve yourself, and essentially what you do is tell your, you try to diet, you're telling your body you're in a famine and your body does a natural thing. You gorge, you get frightened that you're gaining weight. Because you're frightened, you diet more intensely, and now you're off into the cycle of anorexia nervosa. Plus, it resets your body threshold so that the weight is higher. Then there's depression. You feel a little blue. It used to be that you had to keep going out and getting your food and talking to people. Nowadays, you can get a little depressed. You can go in your room, you can shut the door, not answer your email, not answer the telephone, and then you think nobody loves me, and it gets worse and worse. I made a model for this defense regulation thing to try to ask myself, in what situations is it likely to kick itself into high and low states abnormal abnormally? I won't give you the details here, but the essence of this is that if the system doesn't work to defend you, then the next time it becomes more sensitive. If it works well to defend you, the next time it becomes less sensitive. So the threshold is constantly adjusting depending on whether it's doing its job or not. And again, this doesn't make complete sense without looking at the math, but I'll show you a few pictures. This is one where an individual is experiencing two bad moments, and at that point, the threshold decreases and makes it more sensitive. But things go on, and the thing recovers and goes back to its normal state. This is most of us having an auto accident or something. Bad time, we're more jittery for a few days, and then it all comes back. However, if you change the parameters just slightly, and have a chance run. These are the chance runs of high threat conditions. And each, you know, if they're separated, you're fine. But if you happen to get a few of them together, then the threshold goes down and you keep getting excessive responses. And then you can get cycles that take you back and forth between periods of excessive response and periods of regular response. This is very much like what we see with certain psychiatric disorders, with anxiety or depression coming or going. And I think it could be related to shifts in the threshold that are part of a program system that's designed to adjust that threshold. This is speculation. Let's just be clear about that. But it offers new opportunities, I think, for investigating these things. And then I think there are some circumstances where you get into it and you can't, can't get out of it. Once the threshold gets too low, post-traumatic stress disorder, other kind of things, you, you can't get out of it. Most interesting to me, and what I want to focus most on for my own development here, are cliff edge effects. I racked my brain for a couple of months trying to figure out how could we possibly explain why genes that cause schizophrenia persist, given that your average person with schizophrenia, if she's a woman, 70% uh, reproductive success, if it's a man, 50%. Strong selection against these. We all thought 15 years ago we were going to find the, the alleles that cause schizophrenia. We have found none that are common that have effects that in increase your risk by even 1%. And this is the so-called problem of missing heritability for many disorders, especially in psychiatry, autism, bipolar disorder. No genes of large effect that are common. What's going on here? What, what the heck is going on? So, the, I don't, again, this is an idea that's caught on quite a lot, but it needs testing by people with different perspectives than me. If you have a fitness curve that's something like this, natural selection is going to push the trait up that curve right close to the optimum. However, that's very close to a cliff edge, at which point the whole system falls apart. It depends. Well, let's go to this one. Everybody uses Waddington's you know, fitness map as if that's what we're talking about. That's nice for canalization and development and the like, but I think it's quite a misrepresentation of the kinds of fitness uh, d dimensions that we see with many other traits. This is Camelback Mountain, which many of you saw flying in, or you can see it from my house. Um, you could climb up this way gradually, gradually, gradually. By the time you get up here, you'd better not take one more step. Uh, because it could well be your last. This is what it looks like up at the top. That is not one of those smooth, nice landscapes. This is a real rugged landscape where small changes lead to giant changes in fitness. The hypothesis here is that there are many traits, not just the ones I've been talking about, that for one reason or another get pushed close to this edge. You're going to find this being the place where natural selection sets it because you know, on the average, for the combination of alleles, that maximizes their transmission to future generations. It's somewhat back from the optimum because of the danger of falling off the edge. However, you should expect in this model that some individuals will fall off the edge, leading to disaster. 
Um, not only schizophrenia, I'm wondering about things like epilepsy, for instance, another disease that's somewhat heritable. And in even, in, there are all these things where the systems collapse at a certain point. And I think we can take an evolutionary view of these if we're using a systems perspective. Uh, one of my students, Matt Keller, uh, has gone on to become quite a noted uh, geneticist studying mental disorders. And this is a graph from one of his recent articles about alleles that are, make you vulnerable to schizophrenia. Um, these are common alleles. These are uncommon alleles. Notice that the common alleles have just minuscule effects. And there are copy number variations that have quite substantial effects. Nothing in the middle here. But what I'd like you to notice here is there's nothing out there. There are no alleles that are common of substantial effect. You have to ask yourself, what happened to those? And I think the supposition is going to be that natural selection has eliminated them, but that's just a supposition at this point. What's fascinating here is this line. This line is the line that describes the proportion of variation, which is the same for all of these uh, variations. It's 0.04%. It's minuscule. There's something deep here, and I'm interested to have people's help in trying to understand what this means just for schizophrenia and what it means for other diseases as well. Um, this idea of cliff edge effects has caught on to some degree. I've been very pleased that people have kind of taken and developed it in new ways. This is an article that came out a couple of years ago about the evolution of extraordinary defenses, pretty much taking the same point of view in an abstract model. Um, this is one that just came out uh, in PNAS on a cliff edge model of obstetric selection, arguing that the size of the baby's head gives you such advantages that you know, it pushes it right to the edge where some women are going to die and some babies are going to die. Very, it's a different view instead of just saying the head's too big or the hips are not wide enough. It's a, it's a systems view of that conflict. And then we finally come to what I consider the most lovely example. I hope I don't steal your slide, but this slide has inspired me ever since Fred uh, gave a talk about it here. I've heard him give two talks about it recently. And I think there is something deep and profound here in trying to understand how fitness surfaces end up being relatively flat despite the effect of mutations. And I'm going to let him speak much more about that, but that's a hopeful part. This is, I think, why health is possible, despite the fact that we all have all these extra mutations. So my concluding is I think there's an opportunity here at the intersection of complexity theory and evolutionary medicine. And I think we'll have an interesting conversation about this over the next little while. Thanks very much. I think I do have two minutes for questions, right? Yes. We are going to have to pass around this microphone, otherwise people won't be able to hear at a distance. So Randy, you bring up... Uh, so I think on? It's, yep. Okay, great. So Randy, you bring up uh, this, this notion of cliff edge effects with respect to schizophrenia. Um, there, I think we're largely looking at uh, the sort of situation where, we, you know, the reason we're not able to map any important genes is probably because we're dealing with map massive epistasis among uh, you know, large number of rare variants, right? So in that case, natural selection is completely um, inefficacious. And so, if so, what does that do? I mean, so it's natural selection, I mean, the, the whole reason we got this stuff is natural selection can't act. So what does that do to the sort of cliff edge story? You don't need a cliff edge story there if natural selection is impotent because you've So got th I think that's the question on the table, actually, is would we expect natural selection to be acting on those alleles despite the massive epistasis that's involved? Would you say the same thing for height? Because height, you know, similarly has, you know, 60 alleles explaining 25% of the variance, even when put all together, no alleles that have any large effect. But certainly selection is acting on height. Now, I don't think there's a cliff edge of the same sort, but I think we should be looking for asymmetric fitness surfaces. And in fact, this is a question for discussion. Is it just steep fitness surfaces that are the problem? Any steep fitness surface, you go a little ways, you're in trouble. Um, I think asymmetric fitness services where you can climb up one side and get close to a cliff edge are somewhat different, but I need help thinking about that clearly. Yeah. 